this was decided. Do you really think you can change the future? All of this was decided. The truth is what you see with your eyes, not what you think. The latest entry into the Final Fantasy series, Final Fantasy XVI, has taken the RPG world by storm and has been the center for plenty of discussion and discourse. Primarily among those discussions involves the ending of Final Fantasy XVI and what ultimately was Clive's fate when the credits rolled. Now, while the ending itself lays things out rather ambiguously at first glance, once prompted to look a little deeper, I find the answer to Clive's fate to be quite obvious, especially when accounting for certain scenes and symbolism. So, in today's video I'll be laying out the case for what ultimately happened to Clive in the end, with the receipts and sources to back up my claims. So without further ado, let's dive on in to the world of Valisthea. So let me start by saying that it is my understanding that Clive survived, and that he will make it back to the hideout in due time. If you find you disagree with this premise, I hope you'll drop into the comments section below and let me know your thoughts, but for right now, allow me to lay out my case. There is a lot for us to cover, but perhaps the most compelling aspect of the ending in regards to Clive's fate would be the book at the end that reads Final Fantasy by Joshua Rossfield. To me, there are very clear implications that Clive is the one who wrote this book, which, for starters, in order for this book to be written, it's going to require a first-hand account from someone who witnessed the final battle with Ultima. More on that later. But in order to qualify Clive as the author, we must first disqualify the idea that Joshua could have ever written this book. Simple enough, we witness Joshua die with our own eyes, and the game gives him a very emotional and heartfelt goodbye. The idea that they would go through all of this effort with the heartfelt goodbye only for him to survive in the end doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the idea that Clive could have revived Joshua is one I have seen discussed, but as Clive himself will say, not even the Phoenix can bring back the dead. So putting all of that together, we see it quite obvious that Joshua met his end and could not have penned this book himself. So, now on to Clive. I believe the game is constantly alluding to this outcome, with Clive writing the book from many different directions. For one, let's start by talking about the Harpocrates side quest, where he gifts Clive a quill and recommends that when his journey is all over, that he write it all down. Further evidence by this scene right here. When it comes to expressing one's gratitude, I find that words are seldom sufficient. Here. What's this? A Stolas quill. Or more precisely, my Stolas quill. It is said that an owl's feathers are steeped in the wishes it hears over its long lifetime. All those words just waiting to pour out onto the page. So consider this my wish for you. That one day, you may put down your sword and pick up that pen. Well, when that day comes, I'll certainly have a lot to write about. Thank you, Harpocrates. It shall have pride of place in my chamber. So we can see now that the idea has been placed in Clive's head, he has the quill to do it, and a recommendation to do so. If that weren't enough to convince you, let us also consider that this game spends a lot of time showing us that Clive has a love for stories, plays, and books. We see it play out with his Uncle Byron and Jill in particular, as evidenced by these scenes right here. It is I, Sir Crandall of Camelot, loyal servant to Her Serene Holiness, Saint Sybil the Unshod. Meadow, thou vile sorcerer, for thy crimes against church and crown, I shall have thy head. Oh, Clive, my dear boy, it's really you. <laughs> you always were fond of that scene from the saint of the sanctuary. Band. Whenever I got to that part of the story, I always assumed there must be something I'd misunderstood. You had a lot of storybooks, didn't you? In your room, I mean. When we were young. The old legends were always my favorites. 
Epic battles between gods and men. So again, between the deliberate foreshadowing from Harpocrates and the game showing us over and over Clive having a love for these types of stories and books, we can see easily that he would not only be more than capable of writing this book, but in the case of his survival, it would be likely. Another point about this book worth addressing is of course that it has been penned in Joshua's name. Clive would certainly do this not just out of love for his brother, but in taking on Sid the Outlaw's name and legacy, he has a history of using his actions to preserve the life and legacy of a lost loved one. In many ways, it makes Clive a bigger man than just his singular self. He carries the hearts and legacies of his lost loved ones, not just in his heart, but in his actions as well. We're going to come back to this endgame scene at the end to round it off with some minor points and clues, but to keep this section focused on the book alone, between the Harpocrates side quest, his love for books and stories, his history of preserving the names and legacies of lost loved ones, we see how this easily lines up to imply Clive's survival, and that in his survival, he will write a book accounting the first-hand events of everything that's transpired. So next, we're going to move on to my next point of proof for Clive's survival. The next big point worth addressing is Jill and the Star of Metia. Before we move on to Metia's disappearance, let's backtrack to Jill's wish to Metia at the start of the game. Jill wished to Metia for Clive's safe return from the incoming days that lay ahead. It's debatable whether or not Metia even granted this wish in the first place. Sure, Jill and Clive were reunited, but not by a return to Rosaria or a return from the missions Clive had coming on the way when Jill initially made that wish. But we'll get into that more down the road. Let's first discuss a particular side quest with Jill and Clive, and I'll let this scene roll before we dissect it. Before we broke camp, the morning after the storm, do you know what I did? No. What? I slipped away from my governess to climb the tour. And from there I saw a sea of petals, all reaching for the sun. And I realized... that no matter how terrible the night, Dawn would always come. That, that you... That you would always come. For me. And you have. Again and again. That no matter how terrible the night, the dawn would always come. That Clive would always come. This line, which is delivered right before the endgame, barring you did the side quest, plays out literally and figuratively here in the final scenes. Metia vanishing frightens Jill and moves her to tears, fearing as we all did, that this implied that Clive did not survive. But shortly after, in the darkest part of the night, again, both literally and figuratively, the dawn comes. And with that coming dawn, Jill's tears come to a halt, and her face is restored with a sense of hope. Because as we laid out in the scene we just watched, no matter how terrible the night, the dawn always comes. Clive would always come. Listen, if Jill had truly just lost the love of her life, she would have cried for more than just 30 seconds, and it would have taken more than a pretty sunset to make her smile again. This to me seems like an obvious implication to Clive's survival. On top of that, getting back into Metia, I don't believe Metia's disappearance implies Clive is dead. I think it just implies that our beloved cast of characters live in a world where magic and wishing stars are now no longer the way of the world. I also feel as though Clive's life has not been tied to Metia in any symbolic way. Only Jill's wish in the beginning of the game has. And the star disappearing can be interpreted as Clive dying and Jill's wish not coming true, but it can just as easily be interpreted as Metia's disappearance is the cost of Jill's wish coming true. The star disappears as its magic is now used up. Now, let's get to the last major point before I point out some of the minor clues I brought up earlier. Clive washing up on the beach. All things considered, he seems to be in good shape, with the exception of one thing. The bodily decay brought forth by being a bearer has begun on his hand. Obviously, this is cause for alarm, but his condition is nowhere near where the bearers who met their end were earlier in the game. That Sid at points had a petrified hand slash arm, and he was able to continue on surviving using magic, and the petrification was not spreading rapidly enough to kill him off anytime soon. 
it was more of a slow and steady kind of build. That again was the consequence of his use of magic and his actions, and wasn't something that was spreading on its own. Also, with magic gone, I don't see any way for this curse to continue to spread now, because magic, being the prerequisite for the curse, has now faded from the world. Now, does Clive close his eyes and pass out on the beach? Yes. But to me, this seems to be more from sheer exhaustion than it does from actually dying. The characters who die in this game were in far worse condition than Clive was. Take Sid and Joshua for example. They had literal holes in their body and were bleeding from their torsos and out of their mouths. You don't see any such damage from Clive. The game has been very deliberate about the deaths that occur. If the intention was to kill off Clive, they would not have played it as vague as they played it. Now for some minor clues before we wrap this up, let's talk about the song Moon Gazing and the Children at the End. As far as moongazing goes, this is a song that plays at the end, and here are some specific lyrics I believe are worth noting. I was looking up at the moon, searching for something, when I was frightened by the storm. I'm glad it was you who appeared before me, as if none of this had ever happened. I know this fire will never go out. This is clearly in reference to the moment Jill is having here at the end. You have her looking at the moon and being frightened, but then a shift in her mood takes place as it does the song. The line, as if none of this ever happened, could be in reference into No More Magic, Dominance of Bearers, and the story essentially becoming a fairy tale in the future days. And I know this fire will never go out could be a reference to not only her and Clive's love for each other, but Clive himself. Then we have the kids in the final scene, who clearly resemble Clive and Joshua, and we have a dog who's our stand-in for Torgal. To me, this is a clear wink and a nod that the Rossfield bloodline lived on. So again, with all of this said, let's do a quick recap of what we have covered here today. When it comes to the book at the end titled Final Fantasy by Joshua Rossfield, we witness Joshua die with our own eyes, and the game even gives him a very emotional and heartfelt goodbye. Not even the Phoenix can bring back the dead. Harpocrates' side quest where he gifts Clive a quill and recommends that when his journey is all over, that he write it down. The game spends a lot of time showing us that Clive has a love for stories and books. Clive would certainly do this, not just out of love for his brother, but in taking on Sid the Outlaw's name and legacy, he has a history of using his actions to preserve the life and legacy of a lost loved one. Now, recapping Jill and Metia. Priceless side quest where Jill mentions the terrible night, the dawn, and Clive. No matter how terrible the night, the dawn always comes, Clive always comes. If Jill truly felt she lost Clive forever, she probably would have cried for more than 30 seconds. And then, Metia's disappearance could just as easily be attributed to Jill's wish coming true as the inverse. Then we have Clive on the beach. Bodily decay did not go past his hand. He was in much better condition than other characters who had died. Magic is gone, therefore the curse should be as well. Some of the lyrics from the song Moon Gazing and the family at the end resembling the Rossfields. With all this evidence suggesting Clive's survival laid out, I find the implications quite clear. Personally, I find the Harpocrates and Jill side quest the most compelling. That, in my opinion, spell out the ending quite clearly. And then as well, you have Clive's love of stories and books. And when Jill says in that one scene that he was just like any other ordinary boy, it makes me think of the ordinary boy we see at the end of the game who resembles Clive and clearly has a love for those stories and books just like he did. But what do you think, dearest viewer? I want to know, was this video enough to convince you that Clive survived? If not, drop it in the comments below and tell me why. If so, drop it to the comments below and let me know if there was anything else I missed. Anyway, that's going to be all I have for you all today. Thank you very much for watching this video. We'll be back with some more Final Fantasy content in the coming days, but thank you very much. You all be good out there, be good to yourselves and each other, and I will see all of you beautiful sickos and normies next time.